All right, so this is a quick um, kind of what I'm going to talk about. I'll describe 11 VM. I'll talk about a few science examples and talk about some of my future plan for 11 VM. I did want to throw this one slide in. We talked a lot, and we've heard from a few people now talking about the advantage of area detectors. 11 VM in this regard will be kind of a throwback to the past with a series of point detectors. Um, there's advantage and disadvantage to all of these. You've heard a lot about speed, qu very quick collection times. The area detectors are very flexible. On these point detectors, we'll have here, and I'll talk a little bit more, you have better resolution, better background. Uh, very often you'll have extended to theta range, but your data collection times are very much longer. Even at the best, the quickest we can measure at 11 BM, we're talking about the order of minutes. And a standard scan is we're still talking an hour or more if you want something really unique. So at 11 BM, we normally work at 30 keV. Um, that is not a, uh, we found that's sort of the good balance between penetration and flux uh, for most samples. We can change from 15 to 35 keV. Um, we are a high resolution instrument. Our delta D over D is somewhere between, it used to be 2 times 10 to the negative 4, it's now somewhere between 1 and 2, and I'll talk about that a little more, that upgrade recently, which puts us equivalent to the best in the world, if not the best in the world. Our standard scan for a Q range is 25 in a Q of 25 inverse angstroms. And this is for a, an hour mail-in scan, our sort of standard hour scan. If you want to go to higher Q, uh, we are able to do that. Our beam sizes are relatively large because we need good pa pattern averaging over the sample and things like this because we cannot take advantage of the air detector having the full cone. The, so we, our beam is a millimeter by one and a half millimeters. And we run in transmission mode the Dubai sharer geometry. So um, a lot of original earlier sort of high resolution defect timers used a single detector. Um, before I was here at the APS, I was actually at the NSLS uh, working with Peter Stevens there. And there we ran a high resolution instrument using a single point detector. And average scan times with something, be, if you wanted a really good scan, would be something in the order of eight to 10 hours or more if you wanted to get good data. So you'd be looking at a few samples a, a day at, both, at best. We take advantage here, instead of having one detector, we have a bank of 12 detectors, all two degrees apart, giving a total two theta range of 22 degrees. In front of each of these detectors, we have a silicon analyzer cr crystal, which is aligned, as was talked in, was mentioned in earlier talks, so that only x-rays coming from the sample satisfy the Bragg condition. This will bring down the background and improve your resolution. It does have a d downside, which is once again, you're throwing away flux. Everything you do to improve resolution generally throws away flux. Same like if, you're th if you want to improve your background, reduce your background, you're doing that by throwing away flux. We work in two general modes of uh, access to 11 BM. The standard user proposal that we've heard about in the previous things, which is Generally, multi-day experiments. There's three deadlines a year, all committee reviewed. The other, which is unique to 11 BM, is we have a rapid access mail-in program. The rapid access mail-in program is limited to one shift, which would be, if I were scan, roughly eight, sam eight scans. Um, you return this all by email. You don't have to come here in person. There's quick turnaround time. Normally, proposal to data is usually four to six weeks. This is an idealized time. What I mean by that, if you send this the last week of the cycle, when we generally receive something like 100 to 200 samples, it will be longer than four to six weeks for you to get um, data. However, the mail-in proposal, while in good range, is somewhat limited. We can use a uh, nitrogen cryo stream, which allows us to measure from 100K to 450K. Um, but that is still limited to that range currently. So Brian mentioned this a, a minute ago, something he thought um, Lynn and I decided we wanted to try, which is the analyzer crystals along all here have another degree of freedom which isn't often taken um, into account as much as it should be. Not just the, ang the angle, the theta, but there's a chi angle. And the chi angle for most of these analyzer crystals is set well enough once, and you, you kind of leave it and you, you see your resolution and ah, oh, that's, that's fine enough. However, Lynn and I had some ideas that perhaps if we did a more careful idea of motorizing these, we can 
check on the, uh, the alignment of these. And Lynn and I were expecting maybe a 10% gain in resolution if we were lucky and these things were not quite well lined enough. And when, I'm, when I talk to people this, I often try to sell it that I had the idea of exactly how to detect the correct alignment before we set up the motorization. That isn't quite true, as all these things, uh, you play with these on site. And the best way to see how, if these are aligned properly, is not looking at the resolution coming off the, the analyzer crystal. But the fact is, is very slight tilting of the chi will steer the beam and tilt the beam. And so if you put an area, a small area detector behind here and you look at this tilting and steering of the beam, which can be very small and subtle, and slowly adjust this, you can then get more uniformity across all these detectors. And this had the effect of changing our resolution, our inherent resolution of our beam, beam line from these solid lines to these dashed lines here which is roughly a factor, little less than a factor of two improvement in the resolution. Um, which, I'll, I'll be completely honest, Brian thought it was a waste of time. I was hoping for 10%. This surprised me. Um, which shows little differences in alignment make a big difference, and how you design this matters a lot. Uh, there are a number of high resolution instruments that have been designed and set up where you do not have that ability to adjust that chi angle. It's set time one fixed, which means you're inherently hurting your resolution. So let's talk a little bit about some science at 11 p.m. We measure a wide variety of different sorts of science. This is inherent because of our mail-in sample. We measure on the order of 1,000 samples a year through the mail-in program. It's half our time. We have over 100 pu papers published a, a year coming from the program, a mix between on-site and um, mail-in things. Last year was a good year. It was a bit, it just, there was a jump which, to 140 papers. As I said, half our time is on-site experiments, which is, which is normally 10 on-site proposals a cycle. Usually an on-site proposal is somewhere between three and five days. And 50% of our time is mail-in experiments, roughly 80 to 90 a cycle. This is not a hard fixed 50-50, it will vary cycle to cycle. So let's just summarize here some of the strengths here. As I mentioned, high resolution, low background or high signal to background measurements, ease of access. I didn't mention it much, but we can do quite a bit of in situ characterization. We have a helium cryostat that can go down to low temperatures, five Kelvin. We have a high temperature furnace, which can go up to 1600 C. Um, you can do inoperable electrochemical work, as well as many other sort of in situ characterizations. This is less commonly done than at like 17 BM, because as I mentioned, the time scale for data collection is longer. At 17 BM or some of these other beam lines that utilize area um, detectors, you have time scales of seconds to measure um, a pattern. Here we're talking at minimum five to 10 minutes, standardly an hour. So you have to decide whether you need this resolution. So let me show you an example of some science where the high resolution was required. So I'm going to talk about this battery cathode material, magnesium manganese oxide. Let me at least quickly mention why there's interest in magnesium batteries. One of the big ones is safety. So lithium batteries has, has form these dendrites, which short batteries. You might hear recently a lot about of, uh, the Samsung batteries exploding. Uh, I'm not 100% certain, but I would not be surprised if that has something to do with dendrite growth. Um, it, it might not be with those, but I know other materials are sort of off shaking his head, so it wasn't for that. Um, they're high energy electrode material, uh, so they're promising in this regard. There's another good reason for it, which is um, magnesium's very abundant much more than lithium. It's also um, a much more standard major industrial metal. It's used in other regards. So it's much easier to, it's much more abundant, it's easier industrially. There are some downsides of magnesium, which is the diffusion of magnesium is not nearly as good as with lithium. You can see the ionic radius is similar, but the polarization strength is much worse. Um, and any surface film insulates the magnesium. So you need very stable interfaces to be able to have such a magnesium battery. So we need very detailed, in-depth characterization of all parts of this battery, 
cathodes, anodes, electrolytes. And this is a relatively beginning work. What we're looking at is this cathode mineral, magnesium manganese oxide. The structure of this has two sites, an octahedral site and a tetrahedral site. And it's possible, due to the nature of magnesium manganese, for these sites to have some inversion between them. And the question is, is how does that, does that have an effect on the electrochemistry of the battery? We have to understand where these atoms sit very accurately. Uh, this was originally done with 11 BM data. And with this, you can see very accurately there's an invert, there's a, there's a normal site where you have no, next to no inversion if you do a synthesis one way. But you have this is a different way, and you get 50% 50, 50 inversion between the two sites. I quickly threw up some neutron data here as well, because in an earlier talk, um, there was talk about how it was impractical to ever do joint refinements between neutron and x-ray data. Um, and now it's almost routine. This is data taken from Nomad with their mail-in program. So now that we understand this in inversion, we can look at some properties of these two different materials what we would call the normal, the non-inverted, and then inverted. I'm not an NMR person, but there was some NMR work done here looking at migration energies and central resonance things. And you can see that the inverted material behaves substantially differently than the quote-unquote normal material. So this high resolution lets you, high resolution and high Q, we're measuring to, we can get data to, we see these peaks to high angle as you can see in the blow-ups. Let's us understand the nature of this version very particularly, which tell us which of these synthetic roots are superior to others to making the appropriate material, and why is one synthesis behaving very differently than the other one. Let's now show an example of why low backgrounds or high signal background is a strong case. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show an example of palladium nanocubes. Now, most people would say, it's a, nano, it's a nanomaterial. Why do you need high resolution? Uh, you might as well do this with an area detector. Your peaks are so broad. But in this particular case, there's a bit of uniqueness here. Uh, my current users are actually, uh, which, are, which you can speak with them if you have more interest in this, are the, this is data from them. So they made very precisely all similar sized nanocubes. And you might just look at this pattern, and you're like, oh, that's just, it looks like a standard diffraction pattern. Maybe the peaks are rather broad. However, because of the very good high signal to background, or in low backgrounds, you can see these features here. Those are not impurity. Those are interference fringes on top of the diffraction pattern. The first time I saw this, I was extremely surprised, because I did not think such a thing was possible. I'd never seen interference fringes on a diffraction peak like that. From this, they were able to do a series of um, high-resolution TEM and molecular dynamics, doing some um, analyses using the debye sharer equation to get out all sorts of information, size, shape, strain, vibration information of these palladium nanocubes. Let me now talk about some of my future plans for 11BM, particularly plans I have for extending the mail-in program because I believe the mail-in program is kind of one of the unique strengths of 11BM. In the short term, we're introducing a hot air blower to the mail-in program, which will allow us to extend the temperature range that we can measure. Now, we will be limited to roughly 400 C, because in the mail-in program, we use Kapton capillaries. And above that, you get softening of the Kapton. Um, and so going higher is not an option. However, I have a lot of interest of going to lower temperature. There's a lot of interesting science that can be done at 20 Kelvin. A lot of interesting diffraction. And right now, if you want to do a measurement at 20 Kelvin, you have to come out for an extended period of time at a synchrotron. You have to spend for helium most, more often than not, which right now costs about $1,500 for a doer. And you have to be here for many days. And, and especially, that's frustrating if you have one sample. So I'm in the process of designing a, a displex cryostat. A displex cry has a cry cryostat has an advantage because it doesn't use liquid helium. It uses compressed helium gas uh, to do for low temperatures. Now, it can't go quite as low as a helium flow cryostat, but that's fine for a mail-in program. Um, I expect it will probably be separate from the current mail-in program because it will be rather intense in terms of data collection um, and support. 
um, and are probably more competitive than the current program. So let me finish off my kind of overview of 11BM with some acknowledgments. Um, you know, Argon, the DOE. The other half of Team 11BM, who I couldn't do this without, is Lynn Rebaugh, who's sitting right over there. And the overall Structural Sciences Group, who's a, a great team to work with. 